Good evening. Thank you for joining us at our Librarian's World series. My name is Janice and I'll be your MC for this evening. Generations of Singaporeans used to live in single-storey wooden dwellings in villages known as Kampong. Urban redevelopment in Singapore post-independence has transformed the landscape from low-rise housing to high-rise blocks of flats. This evening, senior librarian Ang Xiaoling will highlight resources on kampongs and people's memories of kampongs from the National Library's collections. So a little bit about Xiaoling. Xiaoling has been with the Li Kongqian Reference Library since the 1990s. Her main responsibilities include managing collections, developing content for the library's electronic databases, uh, as well as providing reference and research services related to Singapore and Southeast Asia. I shall now hand over the time to Xiaoling. Thank you, Janice. Good evening, and thank you so much for attending the talk. Uh, I'll be covering two main areas in the talk, the type of library resources available on Singapore kampongs, and also selected aspects of a kampong way of life that most Singaporeans who have ever lived in a kampong might recall. I wish to emphasize that I'm not an expert on the subject. Now, what is kampong? There are three different variant spellings for this word. So C-A-M-P-O-N-G, the word, is often found in early Portuguese, Dutch and English-drawn official town maps and plans to indicate urban wards or neighbourhoods. And according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word compound is thought to be of disputed origin, but um, Yule and Bernal, uh, on weighty evidence, said that the Malay kampong or kamp Kampong spelled with a U as an enclosure and sp uh, space fenced in, and also a village quarter of a town occupied by a particular nationality as the Chinese Kampong in Batavia. Uh, I also did a check with uh, colleagues and I uh, was advised that according to the Dewan Bahasa and Pustaka Dictionary, uh, the old spelling used to be Kampong with K A M P O N G, and the standard Malay spelling is now Kampong K A M P U N G. So this is something that uh, you need to note when you are doing keyword search. Although the spelling K-M-P-U-N-G has always been the spelling for Indonesians when they spell kampung. And a check in the newspaper SG, kampung glam was still spelled as C-A-M-P-O-N-G in 1901. Uh, therefore, kampung is a Malay term for village, originally a cluster of wooden houses raised from the ground and roofed with atep, surrounded with gardens, rows of fruit trees, and nature. Um, and according to this um, student, Rosia, uh, who wrote a, an academic exercise on adjustment to high-rise living uh, uh, with the history of department in 1983, she, I quote that it, it, the kampong is a social unit. It possesses some degree of solidarity neighborly feeling and kinship ties. These characteristics, however, may vary from one village to another. So for some of you who are interested in who are these two personalities, Yule and Bernal, so Sir Harry Yule is actually a Scottish uh, orientalist and geographer, uh, and author Coke Bernal is an English Sanskrit scholar. So both of them are authors of the book Hobson Jobson, a glossary of colloquial Anglo-Indian words and phrases, and of kindred terms, etymological, historical, geographical, and discursive. Yes, it's a very long title for books published during the early years. And this particular title was published in 1886, and we are very lucky, as in we have the 1886 edition donated by Dr. John Bestin, and we also have the 1903 edition that's donated by uh, Mr. Tan Yok Seong. So it is a historical dictionary of Anglo-Indian words and terms from Indian languages which came into use during the British rule in India. So this is the earliest known town plan for Singapore and it was drawn up by surveyor lieutenant Philip Jackson, published in uh, 1828, also known as the Raffles Town Plan, as it was drawn based on Raffles' um, instructions in laying out the physical development of the city centre. So you can see, I try, I think it's a bit small, that the spelling of kampong is still a C, it's still C A M P O N G, okay? And traditionally, kampongs were inhabited by Asian indigenous tribes, 
And uh, kampongs can be found in not only in Singapore, uh, it can be found in Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, Christmas Island, and Cocos Keeling Islands. And one of Brunei's oldest kampongs, Kampong Ae, is the world's single largest water village. Wish I can visit it one day. Uh, occupying the rural and coastal regions of the islands, kampong dwellings are stilt houses uh, built with timber walls and had attached or corrugated zinc roofs or uh, asbestos roofs. And attap was usually sourced from the nipa palm that were found growing abundantly in uh, mangrove swamps. One uh, little fun fact, zinc roofs were introduced in the 1930s, but they were highly prized during the Second World War. So many villagers sold their metal roofs to the Japanese and uh, used attap roofs. And then after the war, they reverted back to zinc roof. Um, there are many different housing types to suit the dwellers' needs based on the resources available. So the size, the roof, the flooring materials were dependent on the financial availability of the occupants. And also a family would rent a parcel of land from a landlord and be responsible for building the house to reside in, along with bathroom and toilet, which was usually located outside, outdoors. So kampongs were also sometimes a reflection of the historical, cultural and religious backgrounds of the dwellers and the environment they were living in. Uh, for instance, the mas Masjid Petampatan, Melayu uh, Sembawang, serves as a place of worship for the Malay Muslims that lived within the Sambawang area and it is now known as the last Kampong Mosque in Singapore. And these are the images of Kampong houses in Singapore through time, taken from uh, various sources, the National Archives of Singapore's photograph collection and also from books like the Singapore 500 early postcards and images of Singapore from the Japanese perspective. So let's say for instance, for this um, particular one, it was taken by an MS Nakajima. Okay. And thanks to the donation of Professor John Ernest Gardinia, uh, who was a professor of pharmacology at the University of Singapore from 1966 to 1981, uh, they are currently undergoing digitization, but we have a small collection of Tanjong Ru villages and uh, Kalang River photographs that are taken during that period of time. And some kampong images uh, can also be found at the Leiden University Library's digital collections. So we can say it's actually a bit all over the world that people do have kampong photographs. Yeah. And uh, G.R. Lambert is also one of the earliest uh, commercial photographers that was among the first to establish a permanent photograph studio in Singapore in 1880s and unfortunately it was closed in 18, uh, 1918. But their works are valuable historical records that uh, provide a visual reference of what Singapore was like during the late 19th and early 20th century. So that is also one source that you can consider if you are looking for images of uh, kampong houses. Uh, now some of the images and illustrations of kampongs and villages can also be found in early travelogues pictorial publications on Singapore and early paintings of Singapore scenes by Charles Dice, who lived in Singapore between 1842 and 1847. Uh, there are also many lovely photographs that are shared on social media, and like Facebook and even on YouTube. And those kampong houses not built on stilts are probably built further inland and so less prone to flooding or high tide. So uh, just to note, like, you can observe from the photographs here that um, the roads are not really well paved and could become very muddy during uh, rainy days. And many of the kampong roads were, uh, many villagers often fill the potholes with rocks or sand. And um, I remember as a kid during Chinese New Year, that was before we have to wear safety belts. We do get flung around in the car when we try to go to kampongs and, and um, yeah visit our relatives during Chinese New Year. So these two um, maps was an excellent job done by uh, another student, Katini Yayit, who did her academic exercise, Vanishing Landscapes, Malay Kampongs in Singapore in 18, 1987. So she plotted um, the Malay Kampongs in Singapore during the 19th century and also another one during the 20th century. You can tell that there are already many 
uh, villages that sprung up uh, at that time. Um, her work has been quoted or cited in this book, um, Kilat Senja, and it can also be found in uh, another book, Kampung Days, Village Lives and Times in Singapore, Revit uh, in Singapore Revisited. So for most of us, what we know about kampongs are from what our parents and grandparents could remember. However, kampongs have been around for much, much longer. In a miscellaneous notes in the Journal of the Streets branch of Royal Asiatic Society dated December 1886, um, there was an article titled Landing, Landing of Raffles in Singapore by an Eyewitness. So an account of the landing of Stanford Raffles in Singapore uh, was witnessed by uh, Wahakim and Orang Laut, who was still alive in 1886. Uh, I quote, this, this was what he said. At the time when Tuan Ra Raffles came, there were under 100 small houses and huts at the mouth of the Singapore River. The place where the Orang Laut lived was called Kampung Temonggong, and it faced the river. There were a few Malays who lived near, their hearts facing the sea. There were no houses in the in the island except at Kampong Temenggong. The first huts on the shore of the new harbour were built under Bukit Chermin shortly after Raffles came. Kampong Glam then was called Saduyong uh, by the Orang Laut. I end quote here. So population and trade growth thereafter and gradually saw numerous uh, kampongs and Chinese villages growing all over the island. Not all information can be found on Google and the kampong names are also not perpetual. Um, the villages might change name over time when they merge to form a larger village. So for instance, in this book by um, Aziza Ali, uh, My Heritage Kitchen, The Culinary Art of Aziza Ali, she mentioned that many of the people living in Kampung Radin Mas had ancestors from Pahang. A small section of the kampong was actually known as Kampong Pahang before it merged with the entire village. And also, there might be some cases of numerous kampongs within a kampong. So for instance, in Hidayah Amin's book, Leluha, uh, Singapore's Kampong Glam, uh, she said that within Kampong Glam, there were Kampong Bali, Kampong Dalam, Kampong Intan, Kampong Jawa, Kampong Kaji, and Kampong Tembaga. So there are lots, it's made up of a lot of small, small uh, kampongs. Now, Katini's academic exercise was done in 1987, about 30 years later, in a joint project between the NUS Department of Chinese Studies and the Department of Geography. A team of part-time research assistants did uh, visual inspection and locating of all kampongs that were labelled on a set of historical maps of Singapore ranging from 1846 to 2010. So that co the cover year coverage is really huge. And they relied on the historical uh, paper maps that were geo-referenced through the effort uh, from the GIS, the Geographical Information System Strategic Initi Initiative of the Department of Geography as a source of both the name and location of historical kampongs in Singapore. Within this map, there are also some kampongs that are unnamed and simply added as unnamed village. So just take note of that also. No listing of maps uh, consulted were found in the website, unfortunately. However, they managed to pin down 220 villages that ever existed in Singapore at some point in time. So these are two early maps just to show you an example of the villages that are um, existing near the coastal areas and riverbanks. So over here, okay, this is the Singapore police map and you can see um, Buena Vista village yeah, and some further up also. And then um, this other map is undated and found at the Leiden University Libraries but because of a proper hospital here. So my guess is it's probably published during the late 1840s because uh, by 1850s that is already named as uh, Tan Tok Sing Hospital. Yeah. So there were also villages that are found around here. You can see Kampong Bugis, Kampong Kalam, Rokpo. So apart from Wahakim's eyewitness account mentioned earlier, in March uh, 
1823, the Secretary to Raffles reported that the Temungong's estimate that there were no less than 79 houses and huts and a population of 607, including men, women and children, in his compound or its vicinities. And the earliest uh, landward map of Singapore, also known as the Butte map, which you can find at level 11, we made a replica of that at level 11. If you're interested, you can view that. So it is... Um, it was probably commissioned within the first two years of the founding of Singapore between 1819 and 1820. Completed around 1820 and is the earliest known landward map of Singapore. So it documents the remnants of Asian, ancient Singapore shown on the map as ancient lines of Singapore. An embankment that ran westward from the mouth of the watering place, which is the Stamford Canal, towards the north side of Bukit Lar Larangan, the Fort Canning. And the map also marks out the palace of uh, Sultan Hussein in Kampung Glam and infrastructure works that were uh, in planning, such as the proposed bridge across the river. And so there could have been more villages that existed during ancient Singapore before its founding by Raffles. Okay. So this is the first ever Singapore Gazette that was published in 1936. It includes various places around the city, like parks and buildings, and some villages uh, and kampongs uh, in Singapore and the offshore islands. For instance, I try to over here. You can see Pulau Ubin, and it marked out uh, various villages found, kampongs found in Pulau Ubin. For instance, Kampung Nordin, Kampung Baru, Kampung Bugis, Kampung Jelitung, and Kampung Melayu. So the National Library currently only has the 1938 edition unfortunately but you can also locate it in uh, our book sg and this is uh, donated by mr lin xiaoping if you wish to look at the 1936 one you can find it in the national library of australia's trove which is a single point of access to a wide range of traditional and digital content held by the australian libraries cultural heritage and research organizations they did digitize and put up the 1936 edition of the Singapore Gazette here. Now earlier I talked about where you can find images of kampung houses and that you can also find names and locations of villages on maps. Now I would like to talk a bit about the naming of villages. Just before the war, there was still ongoing process to name the villages by the rural board. So actually there are quite a number of um, illegal <laughs> occupants on lands that are um, not recorded. So um, in 1938, the Rural Board appointed a committee to locate unnamed villages in rural areas and to give them suitable names. In naming the villages, the committee seek to perpetuate the work of pioneers. So some of the villages are named after their pioneers, responsible for uh, opening up or developing them. And uh, the person in charge was uh, Mr. Lin Chong Pang, who uh, spent a lot of time going to various villages and making inquiries on the spot. You can also search in newspaper SG for articles about place names. There are lots of it. Um, and just to highlight, like for the more established uh, villages, say for instance this um, photo over here, the focus is not on the last tiger seen in Singapore that was killed by the hunting party, but the the village sign that was uh, put outside so this is one marker so by the time uh 1980s when the kid lin took a picture of the kampong uh, mata ikan it's i don't think it's well maintained uh, i mean it's slanted and to one side so this was one article uh, that i found in sunday tribune that mentioned that 34 singapore villages are going to be named soon and the reporter actually heads off to the postman who had to remember which village is at which milestone. And if you look closely, this uh, postman over here, he's looking at the house. Actually, it's high tide. Can, can you see? Yeah, so I'm not sure how he's going to deliver his uh, photograph, his uh, post uh, letters. And this is the other one, another postman. And so they have to know which milestones they, they, they have to go to. 
so while we're at milestones, I just want to show you this uh, map, which is the mileages along roads. Um, the metric system was um, oops, sorry. The metric system was introduced in Singapore in the 1970s. So prior to that, several systems of measurements were used in Singapore. The use of milestones was uh, phased out slowly, with the first kilometer sign post introduced in Bukit at Bukit Timah in 1972. So the rural routes in Singapore were traditionally divided into miles and marked by milestones. Uh, for those of you who have never seen it before, like I don't think I've seen one before, it looks something like this. This is the one that was uh, dug out and now um, at um, three milestones located in Geylang and is now kept with the National Museum of Singapore. Okay. So these milestones uh, were useful for the locals given the absence of recognisable landmarks and a clear system of addresses in many of the rural areas in Singapore during the late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, the milestones are made of sandstone and then later on granite and they were likely introduced by the British around 1840s and usually about 2 metres in height, a bit taller than me, and um, about only 35 cm are exposed above ground. And the system was replaced in 1970s by the metric one using uh, kilometers and milestones were gradually removed. So these days, if you were to take taxi and if it's an elderly gentleman and you tell him, like for instance, uh, our gang five milestone, they, they sometimes will look really happy and they want to tell you more about their memories of the place. Yeah. And the postal districts scheme was introduced in Singapore in uh, 1950. The island then was divided into 28 postal districts, which is still the case today. Uh, with the introduction of postal districts, a road and street directory and guide to postal districts was published by the survey department during the same year. So this is the street directory that was first produced in the post-war era. It serves as another resource to look for the location of kampongs at a specific time. Note that some of the kampongs are still indicated as located at which milestone on which road. For instance, um, I'm not sure you can see here. There's a Kampung Santing located off Thomson Road 5 milestone. And um, actually this publication also is the beginning of the Singapore Street Directory that was published by the Survey Department. So the modern street directory that uh, generations of drivers have relied on before the use of GPS uh, was first published in 1954. So in the first 10 editions, you can still find listings of villages in the index. However, by 1975, it no longer lists villages in the index. It's like a harbinger of things to come. The government stopped producing the street directories in year 2009. Uh, but Mighty Minds is the company that produced the first edition of street directories in year 2000 and became the sole producer of the local street directories. The latest edition was uh, 2020, so actually it's still in publication. I did a sampling of it and I found that in 1954, there were 81 villages listed. By 19, uh, 1957, it was 85. Uh, in 1972, 148 villages uh, were being listed. But thereafter, there's, there's no more listing of villages. It's quite a pity. Right. So from images of kampung houses to maps and street directories, what I want to share next are some selected resources on the study of Singapore kampung. So from left to right, Kampung Day's exhibition Village Life and Times in Singapore Revisited is based on an exhibition curated by the National Archives of Singapore in 1993. It covers various aspects of kampung life seen through the eyes of a child, a housewife and a working uh, adult. The next one, Fishermen in Flats. It is a thesis studying how a fishing village has lost, was lost to development. It records the response of the villagers of Pulau Sudong to resettlement from the time of the initial breakup of a small community to the eventual dispersal of villagers into high-rise public housing estates. So for information since the early 1970s, 
offshore islands have been redeveloped for various purposes. The author noted that one important advantage that island location has over the inland uh, settlement is the ease in maintaining a wide network of contacts with relations living in the real islands, the west coast of peninsular Malaysia, the riverine villages of southern Johor, and the coastal kampongs of Singapore. Okay. And uh, Mr. Ng Yu Ping's book, What's in the Name? Uh, he listed places uh, since 1936. Remember I mentioned about the Gazetteer in 1936, so a uh, majority of uh, the names were like based on that Gazetteer. Yeah? So uh, it has annotations based on sources such as maps, minutes of municipal meetings, Chinese books, and digitized newspapers. So in this particular book, you can find about 130 kampongs mentioned with very short write-ups uh, on how the villagers got uh, their names. Now, Kilat Senja is a very interesting book. Uh, it has many interesting illustrations in the books, like featuring Malay wedding, mass cooking, and family portraits. About 113 villages uh, were mentioned in the book, uh, with highlights on the people and the places of significance. In the middle, Tai Tuo Gang, Dongcheng, Chun Chun Shi Diao Cha. So this is a thesis by the Nanyang University. Uh, and um, it is one of a series of about 10 volumes produced by the former Nanyang uh, University and um, History Department Southeast Asian Chinese History Study Group. So between 1969 to 1970, they covered villages in Paya Lebar, Yishun, Potong Pase, Pongo, Sentosa, and this Tongsing village at Chua Chukang. Each volume uh, provide a description of the villagers' lives and how they survived the Japanese occupation. So theses and, and studies like this are actually very important if you are researching on kampongs. And I also want to highlight, there is, there is this other book, a study on Pulau Tekong. Okay. Um, it is uh, more recent in year 2009, trying to reconstruct village life at uh, Pulau Tekong. Yeah. And you can also refer to a YouTube video in by Zhao Bao last year featuring two brothers who uh, shared in Mandarin uh, their memories of life on Pulau Tekong. It was a very animated sharing with lots of nostalgia. Um, so all villagers moved out of the Pulau Tekong Island by 1987 and it is today dedicated exclusively to military use. Uh, according to these two brothers, many former residents of Pulau Tekong are still in touch with each other. And over 500 of them actually had a gathering in 2015. And at that gathering, a book uh, that is about 27 pages called Tao de Gu Shi was given out during the gathering. Unfortunately, the National Library doesn't have it. So there were once 4,000 villagers that are uh, that were made out of Hakas, Teochews, and Malays living in Pulau Tekong. So actually, it is a very large uh, um, kampong. Interestingly, the kampong scenes in Pulau Tekong, they were captured in um, our media called, no, SBC, TV drama series called Son of, Son of Pulau Tekong. I'm not sure if you've watched it before. So um, it's a 26-episode drama in 1985 that showcased the rustic lifestyle of Pulau Tekong before it was converted into a militarized zone. Lastly is this uh, Bible Asia article that my ex-colleague Afida wrote. Uh, there were lots of descriptions on uh, kampong games popular among children. Could still remember she was so excited about it and we had a lot of chats at our workstations on how to describe how certain games were being played. And of course, the National Archives of Singapore's uh, Archives Online is a treasure trove where you'll be able to listen or read the transcripts of oral history interviews on Kampong Lives and other related resources. You can also check our online databases like Perind and JSTOR, uh, Infopedia, History SG. They, there are quite a fair bit of information in there as well. Okay, now... 
Let's take a step back to see how the government's plans and policies affected the kampongs and transformed the urban landscape of post-war Singapore. So during the immediate post-war years, the need for public housing became a pressing issue. And in 1956, the Singapore Improvement Trust, known as, known as SIT, marked the completion of its first neighbourhood in Queenstown. And by 1960, it was, uh, this SIT was dissolved and its public housing program was taken over by Housing Development Board, HDB. So in the 1960s, state-driven industrialization saw the emergence of factories and industrial estates and the transition of Singapore's economy during the 1950s to 1960s. At that time, Singapore began a massive public housing development program in which the bulk of the Singapore's rural population was moved into new high-rise HDB flats. In 1966, the first uh, sample household survey in Singapore was connected conducted by the Ministry of Law and National Development together with the Economic Research Centre from University of Singapore to collect data for future planning in areas such as rehousing, urban redevelopment, resettlement and traffic planning. Most importantly was the Land Acquisition Act in 1966. Uh, it rep repealed the Land Acquisition Ordinance of 1920 and allows the government the power of compulsory land acquisition. For public development. So this laid the framework for the rapid development of industrial estates and the HDB new towns. The Act was amended in 1973 to curb land speculation and limit the cost of land acquisition. And so between 1959 and 1984, the government acquired about one-third of the total land area of Singapore then, with the bulk of the land acquired under the Land Acquisition Act. In the 1970s, um, Sing well, before 1970, Singapore's population mainly lived in a network of rustic villages. And during 1970s, the government began the housing resettlement program and previous kampong dwellers were relocated to HDB flats in greater numbers. So in most cases, the kampongs themselves have been cleared for urban development or land reclamation. So the Singapore's first concept plan was formulated in 1971 to guide the physical development of Singapore and ensure the optimal use of limited land resources to meet the residential, economic, recreation needs of the population that was projected to reach 4 million by 1992. The concept plan provided a framework of infrastructure development in Singapore and its far-reaching impact can be seen in much of Singapore's physical landscape today. Uh, for instance, it was proposed then that Jurong was reserved for industrial use and uh, the recommendation to relocate the airport from Paya Lebar to Changi. By the, by the 1980s, especially by 1989, 87% of the population are already living in HDB flats. 1990s, well, the second concept plan was launched then in 1991 and addressed the country's strategic use, uh, land use and transportation plan. By then, issues related to housing and unemployment had mostly been ironed out and the country was on the verge of reaching a developed country status with one of the strongest economies and highest GDP per capita in Asia. The plan proposed the development of 10 new satellite towns and there was this, uh, the next lab, a government document launched during the same year, 1991, that set out the framework for Singapore's development over the next 20 to 30 years. Included, included in the publications were ideas that aim to capitalize or improve the country's existing assets in eight key areas, including land use. So, kampung living by then actually became an experience of the past. Next, now we take down uh, uh, now we take a trip down memory lane, which probably many of you all are expecting me to talk about. <laughs> Many of us will be happy to talk about those kampong days for hours, uh, but I just want to highlight some aspects of kampong life for today's talk. So during the um, early days, clusters of kampong wooden huts were in most cases not served with many of the modern conveniences that we take for granted today, like piped water, electricity and sewerage systems. So for the case of electricity, gas lamps lit our street during our early days and were gradually phased out by 1956, replaced with electric street lamps, uh, street lights. And the most 
convenient way for families was lighted candles. I still remember those white, long, tall, white candles that we always have at home. Um, and families used to uh, have those carbide lamps, which I've never seen before. Um, it's this image over here, the carbide lamps. Um, I've seen kerosene lamps that is very common. And these are the main source of light. And even the hurricane lamps were used for areas that required bright illumination like the pigsties or chicken coops, probably to um, protect them from pythons. And in 1963, the Rural Electrification Program or the Kampong Electricity Scheme started to connect every kampong in Singapore to the main electricity grid. It was also the year that the Public Utilities Board was established. So in order to provide cheap electricity to the kampongs, simple overhead um, wires were mounted on poles and they were installed. I'm not sure if you still remember that, but I remember my kites always getting stuck on the, on the wires. Yeah, I'm very bothersome. So today, all of uh, Singapore's power lines are uh, run underground. Uh, the kampongs or villages are roughly divided into three types. So the first group was close to the developed areas and therefore near the power grid. Uh, the second group comprised villages whose houses were clustered together, but at some distance from the power grid. And the third group, which is the most expensive to provide electricity, were the remote kampongs with uh, scattered houses far from the grid. And with electricity, Kampong lives changed as a result. So slowly, villages began to purchase electrical appliances like lights, televisions, refrigerators, fans, and washing machines. The housewives must be very happy then. Then next will be the gas. Uh, firewood and charcoals were used for cooking in the past. And um, the sale of gas for private consumption only increased after the war, uh, especially for cooking. Uh, during the 1950s when the prices of firewood and charcoal was very high. And the use of cylinder liquid petroleum gas, LPG gas, that we are now very familiar with, is in the tank, uh, became a common phenomenon in kampong homes. For the case of water, in the early days there were no running waters and families depended on wells for their drinking water, for washing clothes and for bathing. So during the... Um, dry weather, a water wagon would even be dispatched to supply water, drinking water, to serve several areas and uh, even to offshore islands by, by boat. The provision of fresh water was one of the most important public health measures and it was also required for commerce. Typhoid was a common ailment during the early days. It is a bacterial infection that can lead to high fever, diarrhea and vomiting. It can be fatal and um, the infection is often passed through contaminated food and drinking water. So public pipe water actually started in 1857 and only extended to the rural areas, especially after 1953. Now next, I will go on to trades and occupations of yesteryear. Um, okay. I'd like to talk about the traveling nurses. In 1949, more babies were uh, delivered at home in kampongs than at the Kandang Kabao Hospital, KKH, a women's and children's hospital. And in 1950s, babies were born at the rate of 1,000 a week. So the post-war baby boom resulted in KKH being named in the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's busiest maternal hospital in 1966, having, deliver having delivered about 40 thousand babies uh, that year and we actually kept that record for 10 years. Um, what struck me was the how they have to take a small little sampan boat to offshore islands and so midwife Teresa remembered taking a sampan to St. John's Island and Pulau Blakamati, Sentosa to visit pregnant mothers and there were also resident um, midwives on call 24 hours stationed at clinics at Pulau Brani and St. John's Island. So I asked my mom, who has a friend, used to be a midwife. So I was like, auntie know how to swim or not? She said, no. And you just look at them, they have no life jackets on them at all. So what if what if the sampan capsized? It's, it's just a horrible thought. So there are also traditional housewives known as Bidan Kampong or Jie Shen Fu, 
uh, who will travel to aid those in childbirth. And, um, and one Bidan actually had an unfortunate incident happen to her. In an article in the Straits Times, an interviewee shared that uh, he was told a story by the old timers in the area of a midwife living at Kampong Teban Tejun on the east bank of Jurong River. So she was summoned one night for an emergency delivery at Kampung Sungai Atap on the West Bank and in her anxiety to get across faster, she tried to help the boatman by using her hands to paddle the vessel. Unfortunately, a crocodile snapped it off, snapped off her arm and um, she was unable to continue with the profession. So life as a midwife is fraught with dangers. And there are also other occupations that are no longer um, in demand today, like the charcoal and charcoal stove seller. I don't think I see them selling these anymore. So as mentioned earlier, charcoal stoves were used for cooking before the introduction of gas and electric cookers. And in the immediate post-war period, there were about eight brick um, stone kilns in Singapore, situated mainly in Yochukang and Aukang. There were also travelling hawkers selling a variety of food before they were resettled in hawker centres. And small-scale vegetable hawking was a common occupation for the poor before being replaced by markets in hawker centres. So I remember my grandmother telling me that my great-grandmother will do such things, like she will harvest the vegetables. Actually, it's just a small patch. And then she will kind of walk long distance off to try and sell the vegetables while she stayed at home to look after the pigs and chickens. And then there are also fishermen, traditional vegetable pig and chicken farmers that were slowly phased out. Um, Singapore used to have numerous fishing villages. Uh, for instance, there were three fishing villages in Siglap. So there's a Kampong Hajija, Kampong Lim Chu and Kampong Go Chu, all of which were well established by um, the early 20th century. Fishermen from Sumatra, Indonesia were the original inhabitants of the kampong. And a 1924 newspaper report described a Japanese fishing village of around 100 people being established at Sea Club. But uh, they, they were attracted to the area by the abundance of fish in the surrounding waters, but they left the area prior to the outbreak of Second World War. This shows that it is not just the Chinese and Malay fishermen that occupied these villages, but there are also fishermen from as far away as Indonesia and, J and Japan that were once living amongst us in our kampongs. So besides uh, fishing villages, there are also other rural villages found in Siglap area by the mid-19th century. These included uh, Chinese villages which were situated along the beach and Malay villages that were found further inland. The Malay villagers in Siglap, they were well known for organizing annual kole uh, races, which I've never seen before, but sounds exciting, along the beachfront, involving traditional killless, uh, killless uh, canoes. And um, these races drew participants from other parts of Singapore, as well as participants from uh, Johor, Malaysia, and, and the surrounding islands. The last pig farm was closed down in 1990, and they were mainly located at Pongo. Um, this is because concerns over water and air pollution, as well as the cost of expensive land, um, the government felt that it would be more cost-effective to import all pork. So the pig farmers were compensated about a total of $50 million, and um, they turned into growing orchids and ornamental fish instead. Okay. Now... Well, we might all know that Bishan used to be a Chinese cemetery known as the Kuang Wai Shiu Pig San Ting that was established in 1870. There, was, there also existed actually a Kampong San Ting there, a Cantonese village that began as a small community of settlers engaged in the funeral trade. So that was also gone um, with urban redevelopment. And also cremation was made uh, popular in the 1960s. So living near the coastal areas means having access to mangroves, which offer mangrove timber that can be used for firewood, charcoal, fishing poles, medicine, and tanning materials. And um, I'm not sure about you all, like when they're selling uh, satay, even the ketupat, they use palm leaves to it. So I find that to be actually very environmentally friendly, like the sabun, sabun lidi, which is a broom made up of dried um, uh, coconut leaf, uh, yeah, veins, they just tie it together. They do a pretty good job of uh, 
when you want to sweep the floor. And of course, there's also provision shops and kopitiams, places where the villagers congregate. Now, many games were played by children living in kampongs, and without fail, they, they are always featured in books talking about kampong life. And some would catch fish, dig cockles, catch crabs, or pick fruits from various fruit trees grown in the village, like star fruits, jackfruits, chiku, custard apples, rambutan, durians, jambus, mangoes, and the list goes on. It was fun but also helped put food on the dining table or even it can bring in some meager income. Most of the villagers had uh, villagers from the same village or province in China or other parts of Southeast Asia, or they share the same trade or occupation. So it was common to find a temple or church or mosque within a kampong. And Chinese opera performances then were related to temple festivals and more popularly, associated with the Hungry Ghost Festival. So festivals and celebrations are actually great opportunities to bring people together because the food sharing experience and also through the process of helping each other with the food preparation and cooking enhances social relationships. It was common for neighbours then to look out for one another, for instance, boring seasonings, uh, temporary babysitting while the mother ran errands, house building or repairing roofs or boats. This is the not so pleasant part, but um, yeah, I have to talk about it. The night soil workers were a common everyday sight in uh, the 1940s and 1950s in the urban areas. So this was usually done discreetly along the back lane or through the back doors. And the night soil worker would remove the night soil in two buckets carried on a bamboo pole across his soldiers by the front door. So for the villagers, pit latrines were located outside and shared by a number of families, but some families would have their own toilet. And within the shelter, there's a drop hole in the ground with a slab over the hole. So once the pit was full, the waste would be emptied manually or disposed discreetly uh, to the nearby waterways. So some villagers also use um, the content as fertilizers or they are buried in trenches. Uh, this kind of poor sanitation and hygiene practices often led to public health problems with frequent outbreak of typhoid fever and diarrhea. So the rural board was established in uh, 1909 to administer the rural areas, including surrounding islands of Singapore. And it continued to operate until 1958 when the district councils took over. So in their annual report, you can find information on environmental hygiene reported by the chief health officer, uh, like the construction of drains, latrines, wells, and provision of standpipes. Uh, and by 1955, it reported that more have installed plumbing system and septic tanks. After Singapore gained independence in 1965, the government decided to invest more in sewage management infrastructure as part of the efforts to curb pollution of the nation's precious water resource and uh, improve the quality of life of the growing population. So this led to the sewerage master plan formulated in the late 1960s, which divided Singapore into six uh, sewerage catchment zones. And within each zone, uh, pumping stations would channel sewage to a centralized treatment plant where the sewage would be treated uh, according to international standards before being discharged into the sea. So with modern flush toilets everywhere now, the night soil workers become redundant and have fulfilled a useful role in public health service. Um, in 1984, over 90% of the population was served by modern sanitation system. And I'm very thankful that by the time I was born, we, we are using modern flush toilets. So um, we are spared from the 50 shades of browns and what other creepy crawlies that you might find there. And when it was very dark um, at night or heavy downpour, um, I asked my mom, so do, do you all like venture out to such places to do what is necessary? She said that it was common for villagers to use the traditional spiton or the chamber pot made of enamel. Yeah, so she had a good laugh when recently, I think it was on sale on Amazon. They kind of marketed it as a fruit basket or to put baguette, it was just bizarre. So there is actually a thesis written on the sewers and sanitation in Singapore from the years 1930s to 1950s. Uh, 
year 2000, I think. It was published in year 2000, uh, written in year 2000 by an NUS student. Okay, disasters. So the living conditions uh, in kampongs were far from ideal, and whenever the monsoon seasons arrived, there would be instances of people and animals drowning with landslides, falling trees, and loss of livelihood. So 1954 was the year of several floods, um, and other major floods were also recorded in 1969, 70, 80, 84, and 85. Houses made of wooden planks and attap roofs are very flammable and could often lead to the entire village being destroyed. So many were left homeless with loss of possession and even lives during fires. Causes of fires usually range from the overturned kerosene uh, lamp, burning joss paper or lighting firecrackers. So some villages had their own uh, firefighting squad to protect the kampong and guard against fires. One of Singapore's biggest fires occurred in Bukit Ho Sui in 1961. And the area had previously suffered a large scale fire in 1934. Um, when a blaze uh, burned down 500 uh, wooden attap houses in Bukit Ho Sui and two other nearby kampongs. And another fire occurred in 1959 um, in the neighbouring kampong uh, Tiong Baru, destroying homes of around 12,000 people. So it's really very bad. So lastly, uh, let me highlight some of the books very quickly uh, that you might be interested to read. So to the people who have lived in a kampong, um, we often share about the founding of the village, the, the personalities and the places, for instance, like um, a Kapitia market, temple schools, and memorial event, mem in events or um, disasters like uh, fires and floods. So some larger villages are multiracial, and all villages got along well with spoken Pasa Malay or dialects. And to those who have never lived in a kampong, forming a connection to that kind of life is actually quite a challenge. Like when you try to tell your nephews how you used to play kites and stuff like that, it's, it's uh, well, almost a blank look. They don't quite get it. So um, over here, I would like to show you. So there are various types of publications from businessmen to chef to heritage enthusiasts who, um, and also studies based on oral history interviews and research, uh, like this first title by uh, Lim Hao Sing, Lim Xiao Sheng, Pan Jia Chun Shi. So um, how useful are they for research? Uh, what kinds of information do they offer, like photographs, descriptions, and knowledge, really depends on the details that is found in the books and the rigor of the research. And uh, this one. This is one book that I find uh, really interesting. Uh, it's... Um, captures the steel frames of uh, Singapore's kampongs from 1968 to 1983 in 132 Chinese ink on paper paintings by artist and cultural medallion Ling Ziping. And in there, he depicts people, scenes and life in Malay kampongs. For example, um, let's see, let's show you. he painted a Malay lady grinding sambal. I think he must be very fascinated by that because I found two paintings of that. And also, um, I'm not sure you can see this. So there's a painting of a sarong cradle that works like a hammock where they usually they used to um, put the baby in there and rock the baby to sleep. So there are also Malay titles, but not a lot. Also, maybe because of my language abilities, I didn't manage to find more. And of course, there are a lot more English titles. And um, Josephine Chua Chia actually wrote three books on um, Potong Pasir. So over here. So she wrote three books, uh, different years in 2013, 2017, and 2018. So it's all about her uh, growing up years in Potong Pasir. For me, there are two titles that are quite interesting because not many books covered that. So for this book, Once Upon a Taising Village in there, uh, the Taising Village was established in 1914. So it's actually quite uh, a village with quite a long history and saw four generations about uh, 1,500 families that lived there until they have to be resettled 
to Bedok and uh, Macpherson between 1977 and 1999. So in there, it mentioned that Taising was a popular hideout for many gangsters and triad groups. So for example, the numbers 18, 32 or 36 uh, with frequent turf wars and, and, and they also extort money from people for temple funds. Um, and then this book, Kampong Chai Chi, is also very interesting. Um, it talked about mutual help, which uh, was very common in villages, and also that uh, keeping the community safe was very critical in the villages way before the network of neighborhood police centers were, were set up. And um, let me try and scroll down. So Chai Chi used to have gangsters also, and it's gang number 24 and gang 303. Uh, I'm sure they didn't follow the postal district code. So I wonder if they have any directory to indicate how they derive these gang numbers and uh, where they were located. So, and yeah, it would be quite interesting to, to research on that, but I think it's, it's very tough. So the usual modern imagination of uh, Kampong life is one that is peaceful, uh, free from rat race and with more character and a hard working person can do any work and will still be able to lead a happy and contented life. However, we could tell from some narratives that life was hard and even fraught with dangers and inconveniences. Kotong Royong or mutual cooperation was born out of necessity and in some cases it developed into a true and lasting friendship among villagers. Um, the example of Pulau Tekong villages, and, and they maintain contact even after they had left their kampong. So, kampong life is actually very varied among various kampongs, and each kampong has its unique stories to tell. It is not a singular narrative across all. So, my kampong memories, if I still have time, oh no. It was a regular uh, weekend stay over at a house next to the streets of Johor when I was young, and my grandfather opened a small provision shop. And for a long time, I thought that when the Malays called him Sinke, I thought that was his name. So actually, it meant new guests. And there were a few um, uh, Teochew-speaking Chinese families in the kampong who were either related or from the same village in China. So my aunties and grandfather moved out of the seaside kampong in 1999. They were the last few villagers to, to leave, and the surroundings by then were overgrown with grass, and there were occasional sea snakes slithering through the front porch. That, that didn't happen in the past because there were people around. So um, what freaked my auntie out was a large cobra trying to lung at her when she opened the toilet door outside the house one day. So years later, when everyone had left, we revisited the place during Chinese New Year and um, it had become pretty unrecognizable. And um, to be honest, I absolutely hated it when I found nails on the coconut tree that I, I grew up with and words um, carved on the trunks of a uh, jackfruit tree and also unripe star fruit strewn all over. You know, people have been picking it for fun. Um, then again, the moment they tore down our little wooden house and removed the wooden fence, it's, it's no longer home. Yeah, so with that, I thank you so much for your time and uh, I end my presentation. Yeah.